friends, as you know, uh, we've already started uh, a series, a new series, uh, and it was announced uh, the, in the previous occasion. And uh, uh, as, as you know, uh, the, the title of the series <coughs> was The 20th Century Poetry. And uh, if one has to divide, you know, literary uh, expression uh, through centuries on the basis of the century to which the writing belongs, then it would, be, uh, uh, it would appear rather mechanical. But then, as, as you come to think of it, uh, in the 20th century, the contours of literature <laughs> changed radically. Uh, I can safely say that the 19th century belonged to fiction, and the 20th century, in that sense, belongs to poetry. It's a, it's a debatable issue. Maybe some people agree, some people don't agree. But so far as we are concerned, we think that the, the stamp of the 20th century life, its problems, the aspects of, of, of the very existence of uh, human uh, existence, all these things, you know, require that uh, the distinct, uh, you know, uh, expression, the, uh, uh, the distinct mode of uh, expression in the 20th century should be, should be realized and should be talked about, should be under discussion. So for that purpose, uh, the, the first lec lecture by uh, uh, Professor uh, Pail Nagpal, who teaches uh, English uh, in uh, Janaki Devi Memorial College, Delhi University, uh, in her first lecture, uh, she will tackle the question of uh, the relevance of, the, the, the very existence of, the distinction, distinctive marks that poetry bears in the 20th century. So uh, without uh, further, you know, uh, explanation of the point, I would request her, I would ask this question from her whether she agrees that uh, there is a distinct kind of stamp on poetry uh, from the 20th century angle. Thank you, Professor Prakash. And uh, uh, I completely agree with you. In fact, this is one of the points that uh, I was just going to begin with, that poetry has been uh, a very important, a very, uh, you know, off revered genre throughout centuries, throughout the ages. And uh, you very rightly put it out there that the 19th century is known for fiction. And I would agree with that statement because, uh, of course, we do have the Romantic poets, we have the Victorian poets. But there is a kind of churning that's happening and that churning, the social churning is reflected in terms of the genre of the novel. So the, the, the novel emerges in a very important way and uh, uh, like we, we say very often that uh, if we want to know about uh, the history of uh, let's say the French Revolution or we want to know about uh, subsequent revolutions in France or what was happening in England in the 19th century, we need to just head towards the novels and we will get a very fair idea about the kind of changes that took place in uh, society at that time. And uh, similarly, when we come to the 20th century, it's very interesting that a lot of, uh, there are so many manifestos that were written in the 20th century at the turn of the century. So a uh, lot of isms that were there and which is why, uh, uh, you know, 20th century or the modernist uh, period is known for uh, its avant-garde writers, they were way ahead of their time. And all of them actually refer to poetry in some form or the other, mm -hmm. which means that there is something about this genre that has uh, a very distinct appeal. And in fact, I would say that uh, 20th century fiction takes its cue from poetry. Mm -hmm. And uh, the transformation that we see in 20th century fiction actually emerges from the way in which Poetry as a genre changes in the 20th uh, would century. Would you offer uh, uh, an example of uh, uh, fiction look, looking towards poetry in the 20th century? I think if we just look at uh, the novels, uh, you know, by Virginia Woolf or, oh. uh, you know, James Joyce, I mean, it's all sheer poetry. Mm -hmm. Even uh, and in one of our series, we discussed a novel by Samuel uh, Beckett. Beckett. Mm -hmm. So uh, there, there is a sheer poetry there. But this poetry is specific to the 20th century. It's not the poetry of the 19th century. It's not the poetry of uh, the earlier period, but it is poetry that uh, belongs to the 20th century and that is taken in the novel. And see the interesting aspect, you know, the 19th century uh, uh, begins with poetry, the new kind of poetry yes. called the romantic poetry yes. and uh, it, it, it creates a kind of a gap between itself and the, and the 18th century poetry, which is not poetry at all, mm. which is ideas. ideas. And in fact, uh, uh, poems like uh, uh, essays, essays on criticism, essay on criticism by uh, Pope is more of criticism than, than, than poetry itself. Yes. But then there is a, uh, as you rightly say, uh, there is a gap between romanticism that emerges at the end of the 18th century and goes through the first quarter of the uh, 19th century. And uh, you know, uh, 
on that side is classicism and uh, romanticism and here it is romanticism and something else maybe realism yes. and realism and poetry somehow uh, distant cousins they they don't exactly relate with one another yes so very apt phrase distant cousins i think that that uh, really uh, has a lot of appeal because when we discuss the 19th century very often we find it difficult to kind of uh you know uh, how to uh, you know assess these movements that are happening around the same time mm -hmm. and uh, especially in the context of realism which is a Euro european phenomena in that sense mm -hmm. so yes distant cousins would be a very apt uh, phrase to kind of understand these so uh, uh, to begin with when we look at uh, you know 20th century movements there are so many and uh, the first uh, two decades of the 20th century has in fact almost 1890s onwards there are so many movements we have expressionism we have cubism there is futurism dadaism later the bauhaus uh, surrealism vorticism imagism and many more and of course in uh, drama we had naturalism if we look at the manifestos of uh, some of these so there was this uh, magazine uh, known as blast in which the uh, the manifesto Uh, of the vorticists was uh, published this is in 1914 and windham lewis uh, uh, was bas basically the person uh, behind it uh, one can pay attention to the way in which uh, the words are uh, put on the page here uh, they are not in paragraph or sentence form they are written in bold and spread across the page and this is how the entire magazine carried uh, different uh, inputs and uh, the idea was to immediately catch the attention of the reader and there was a reason for it and i shall come to that similarly we have futurism and this is uh, uh, marinetti and uh, the term futurism itself tells us that you know the the futurist thought that they were uh, totally breaking away from tradition and coming up with something that was extremely modern and this is uh, in 1909 uh, we had surrealism in the 1920s and uh, this is the period of high modernism and again we had manifestos and one can see uh, just a view of uh, these pages uh, shows us how uh, uh, it was important for them to kind of immediately uh, you know uh, get the reader to think and get the viewer or not just the reader the viewer who's looking at the page and the way in, it, in which it was it has been designed so when we're talking about so many isms just to kind of briefly mention for instance futurism which was conceived by uh, filippo uh, uh, marinetti and there were others like um, uh, umberto uh, uh, bocchioni and uh, carlo carra and so on marinetti was a poet and uh, he brings in industrialization the car machine speed this beca becomes a very important uh, point of entry for them and they talk about poetry they entirely reject the way in which the 19th century uh, kind of looked at poetry and at the same time one must say that there was also a huge anarchic tendency in the in the futurists so um, similarly influenced by uh, you know uh, futurism and cub cubism was windham lewis's uh, vorticism and uh, as mentioned the the manifesto was published in the blast magazine so if we talk about uh, the futurist manifesto it it specifically mentions poetry and says that uh, to quote from uh, the futurist manifesto the essential elements of our poetry will be courage audacity and revolt and uh, they go on to say how literature has up to now magnified pensive immobility ecstasy and slumber we want to exalt movements of aggression feverish sleeplessness the double march the perilous leap the slap and the blow with the fist i think these lines just uh, you know put both aspects out there one poetry of courage audacity revolt but at the same time a complete break from the past and a hugely anarchic tendency that is based on aggression break from the past yes <clears throat> which means this is a historical Uh, uh, in a sense yes because they say that you know this period should totally be done away with and uh, even the vorticists uh, though of course the vorticists were uh, you know provided a repost in a sense to the futurists but they also kind of uh, you know uh, moved away from uh, whatever was there in the past and when you move away from history 
and uh, th then uh, you become, that is the person becomes or the poet becomes anarchic. Is yes. that what you mean by yes. anarchy yes. in the 20th century? Yes. yes, and also because, you know, uh, the futurists particularly, since we're talking about them, uh, base themselves on aggression and, uh, you know, almost kind of supporting a kind of uh, war and militarism and so on because they felt that everything needs to be done away with and, you know, we need to march ahead and catch the attention of the people. So, um, and uh, uh, which is where, uh, you know, today when we will discuss T.S. Eliot's essay, it becomes extremely significant to place it in this context. And in a general uh, way, how is it that we explain so many isms in, in, in the 20th century? It's a, it's a plethora of isms, it's, it's, a, it's a plethora of ideas. Yes. So, uh, one of the most important moments, I think, for uh, the 20th century was a moment of experiment. Mm -hmm. where all these, and a lot of them were short-lived, the futurists and all were not very, they, these movements did not take off in the way that uh, other movements probably did. Mm -hmm. But when we use the blanket term modernism as a movement of the early 20th century especially, it encompasses all these isms. And uh, uh, each person felt that uh, each uh, writer, uh, be it a poet, be it uh, the writer of the novel, they all felt that uh, the way in which literature uh, existed in its relationship with society, that had to change. And the individual, of course, became a very important entity where we can probably safely say that in the 19th century, it's the social view, uh, uh, you know, I mean, going back to Balzac society as a historical organism. So from there to the individual as a cornerstone of these movements. I think that is the shift. So each, uh, uh, you know, uh, Avaga writer that was experimenting wanted to kind of imagine things in uh, her or his own way. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, for instance, they say that we want to sing the man at the wheel, the ideal axis of which crosses the earth itself hurled along its orbit. So the man as the individual entity becomes very important uh, for this. And uh, at times, uh, you know, the, there are also contradictions, but, uh, you know, here the idea is to get an overview of uh, how uh, so many of these writers were trying to experiment and come up with a structure that was radically different from the structures that existed earlier. Mm -hmm. So, uh, to get back to, uh, uh, you know, very briefly on futurism, so the, the, uh, the important point here is the reference to poetry. And again, they say that the poet must spend himself with warmth, glamour and prodigality to increase the enthusiastic fervour of the primordial elements. So something which is a violent, and they say that, you know, poetry must be a violent assault on the forces of the unknown to force them to bow before man. So they imagine a certain aggression in poetry. And uh, of course, they also, you know, uh, glorify war and uh, patriotism and militarism. So, they're also very anarchic in that sense. And, uh, you know, they want to, they, they actually go ahead to say that we want to demolish the museums and the libraries. Uh, to move to vorticism, and uh, these are actually lesser known movements. So, there's a rebel art center that is formed by Wyndham Lewis. And uh, they talk about how the artists and the writers, they stand for the reality of the present not for the sentimental future or, you know, a kind of sacro a sacrosanct past. So, you know, the, the moment is uh, what they hold. And uh, so, uh, you know, uh, they, they want what they call the unconsciousness of humanity. And uh, you asked a question about, you know, the complete break from the past. So, to quote from uh, the Blast uh, magazine, so there is a statement that says, um, curse the flabby sky that can manufacture no snow but can only drop the sea on us in drizzle and goes on like this that blast France, blast England, blast humour, blast the years 1837 to 1900. So this is, this is how, uh, you know, these writers wanted to, it was almost as if this was a complete rejection of the way in which literature really speaking uh, uh, existed, the way in which writers envisaged not just literature, the process of writing, but their own connections with society. So, uh, yeah, there is an interesting question here. The question is uh, uh, inherently uh, uh, interesting. Uh, how come that uh, the statement that you quote has reference to only the European nations? 
Uh, well, that's where they pitch themselves. Mm -hmm. So that that's the reason. This is a quotation from the uh, so, so, blast. So they attack all the uh, yes. European nations that they should not be there. What about the rest of the world? Uh, well, I think uh, these writers at that point were concentrating more on, it was also, I mean, one can almost say that there was this sense of elitism to uh, look at only the European nations, but but certainly… And they had in their stranglehold the rest of the world the, they as, had, as, as, yes. as colonies. Yes. So, uh, and in the colonies, uh, what would in the 20th century people say about poetry? I, I was just wondering, so uh, not that, that that's our uh, direct topic today. Uh, so to to actually address this, the the uh, as I said that you know it is uh, uh, very elitist in that sense to mm -hmm. only uh, you know look at uh, the way in which changes were taking place in the European countries. But having said that, uh, the modernist trends actually influenced literature all over the world, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, in a certain sense, even in India, there is writing that was deeply influenced by the modernist trend and. Uh, within Europe also, I think this trend goes on for very long and the very fact that a lot of post-isms uh, keep going back to modernism. Mm -hmm. But somewhere I think what we forget is that modernism looked at a complete break from the realism of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, uh, one needs to read it historically, uh, though of course uh, the position they take is completely ahistorical, uh, that of rejection. Mm -hmm. So, uh, 20th century poetry, so in this sense, uh, you know, the, the idea was to, these are just two uh, lesser known movements and the idea was to bring these to the fore to uh, uh, help one understand that uh, there were many manifestos and all of them were projecting uh, how writing could be done in a very different manner and this manner had to be different from that of the 19th century. No, what one is to admit that uh, as you uh, as you have suggested earlier that uh, modernism also is a kind of uh, expression of uh, what, what can we call freedom because uh, yes. the, the individual is freed from the, uh, the social environment and, and, and the individual has his own or her own you know assertive points and that it wants now to realize himself or herself uh, individually. It, it's, uh, that, that is the a point that you are making very rightly. I think uh, uh, the freedom of the individual and the freedom of the artist mm -hmm. who wants to uh, you know kind of reject convention mm -hmm. and feels that now turn of the century and turn of the century also carried with it a lot of movements like we had Freud and we have uh, Bergson. So uh, these factors also led the artist to kind of reimagine uh, uh, their world in, in terms of writing, in terms of art, expression and the way they visualize their connections with society and humanity at large, which was primarily from the perspective of the individual. Mm -hmm. So if the 19th century was known for the realist, the romantic, the naturalist tendencies, the turn of the century yearned for a kind of break from all that was represented in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. So, um, and. Uh, any discussion on poetry will have to address these uh, questions about what really speaking is the nature of this particular uh, imagined break. One can't really break away from the, the past, mm -hmm. but the point is that what were these and which is why these were referred to as Amagat movements because they were way ahead of their time. So um, there was also a sense of uh, power I think that the writer was trying to claim and was always modestly in a sense conscious of this particular power, so which be became a tool to understand the society in which they were uh, operating. So uh, 20th century poetry as uh, discussed earlier also finds its way into many genres and primarily into fiction and uh, you know as court poetry, patron based poetry is replaced uh, by poetry that represents the society. So new emerging social groups, a changing landscape, uh, poetry also becomes important as a kind of vocation and uh, this I think is a new thing that the 20th century really uh, gets and uh, it's important that the 20th century is also, uh, uh, you know, we have the, the suffragette movement and so on. So uh, there too I think women as poets also kind of, Im uh, you know, they've always been there but prominently, uh, you know, as they, they emerge, it's it's. Was there modernism in the women poets in the 20th century as, I, as, as clearly uh, asserted, uh, as effectively presented? So this is a, uh, you know, uh, 
a difficult question in the sense to answer because the modernism I think of the women writers I would see it as different from the way in which though of course uh, it would probably today not be appropriate to look at it in terms of binaries uh, especially in the context of the 20th century but the fact that uh, if there is a space within modernism that the women were kind of where they were asserting themselves then I think they certainly did it in their own way and imagined it in their own way and uh, why go very far because we are looking at how poetry uh, finds its way into fiction and Virginia Woolf here would be a classic example on both counts on the way in which she absolutely transforms uh, the genre of fiction and by bringing in poetry into her writing and how she does it as a woman. So, I and uh, interestingly important. she combines poetry with fiction yes. but she doesn't write po poetry she doesn't write independently. Poetry. Yes, mm. yes. So, she in a way renders uh, uh, his, her prose, her, her fiction, her, her narrative uh, with the help of poetry. Yes. Mm. So, that, that, that's the woman there. That's the woman there, mm. absolutely. The, the reality of the circumstance yes. that is expressed through fiction but that fiction itself becomes poetic. In fact, uh, to extend this further, when, when the modernist writers, both men and women, say that, um, that reality now has to be looked at differently in literature, so I think the women are saying that yes, if reality has to be looked at differently, then our reality is different mm -hmm. from the way in which I think the male writers were uh, kind of uh, imagining their world. So, I think, uh, I mean, a novel like Mrs. Dalloway does complete justice uh, to the poetic aspects of uh, the novel as well as the sensitivity, I think, of uh, the woman as writer. Mm -hmm. So, oh, well, that's the point to be made. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, here, I think, uh, having uh, created this particular backdrop, it uh, uh, becomes important to now bring in a very important uh, essay by T.S. Eliot, uh, which is titled Tradition and Individual Talent. Uh, which uh, is written around 1919, so uh, where he says that uh, there is a complete break but he raises the question of tradition and he says that we generally use tradition as a kind of pejorative and we look at a, we look at a writer only in terms of newness and see you know what is the kind of newness that is there in the writer because if there is newness and you know the writer can be appreciated uh, only on the basis of that. So, newness uh, in a writer becomes, uh, you know, a kind of index according to which one can uh, gauge and judge them. So, the, the term traditional is uh, used in, you know, uh, uh, in, in, in a negative or a pejorative uh, sense to say that uh, the poetry of this person is traditional. And uh, uh, so, he, uh, T.S. Eliot, and to quote from the essay, he says, if we approach a poet without this prejudice, we shall often find not only the best but the most individual parts of his work may be those in which the dead poets, his ancestors, assert their immor uh, immortality most vigorously. This is, I think, uh, a very important uh, point of discussion here because uh, where there are so many isms where the, the writers and all these groups that they form, they all want to totally, uh, you know, demolish the past, so to say. And here emerges uh, this essay in 1919 where T.S. Eliot says that uh, if we look at uh, the work and the poet without the prejudice of the traditional, then he says we will find, you know, the individual parts will be the best parts actually where we see the dead poets and ancestors who assert themselves. So, <clears throat> my reading of this essay is slightly different. I believe he is supporting a kind of tradition. Uh, through the individual, the individual individuality, as I understood it, maybe uh, I was wrong. I understood it as individuality in his essay coming in the way of uh, tradition, and, and and the tradition is to be recognized somehow. <laughs> this uh, is that's the second part of his essay. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. in the first part of his essay, he actually talks about how history cannot be done away with, mm -hmm. and how it's very important to see that reflected. Mm -hmm. the, the essay has three parts actually, one where he talks about this, mm -hmm. second is the depersonalization of mm -hmm. uh, you know the, the individual mm -hmm. and uh, the third is of course uh, you know a, a short concluding uh, uh, paragraph. So, he begins by talking about the traditional and says that uh, it is important to probably uh, look at the connections and to not use it as a pejorative. Mm -hmm. So, I think he unpacks the term uh, traditional in a very different way and he looks at the uh, the, the, the presence, I think, of uh, uh, writers who were there earlier 
in the in the work i think of uh, the 20th century writers and uh, here i think this this essay kind of makes uh, to my mind at least a certain kind of departure mm -hmm. so oh well <coughs> friends uh, uh, dr parnak pal has uh, spread his net wide he has talked about the 19th century background uh, against which 20th century shines as as a century of rebellion as a century of rejection as a century of uh, individuality and these are uh, important things to consider and uh, maybe uh, these these points will help us understand the true nature of uh, poetry in the uh, 20th century and uh, the uh, at the towards the end of the uh, discussion uh, professor pal nagpal brought in the question of tradition and individual talent and individual talent is also uh, shrouded in some kind of irony because so when the eliot is concerned he he called himself an anglo catholic mm -hmm. so uh, a person you know who was an individual but who was catholic yeah. in, in his yes. beliefs so uh, uh, we'll discuss this essay further and we'll also talk about uh, for instance the the questions of the two wars that visited the 20th century unlike any other century in human history which had one even one world war yes. so that kind of thing and uh, that may have decentered the individual and and uh, 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 thrown him into or her into uh, into the <coughs> kind of confusion uh, that, that the 20th century represents so all these questions will be taken up briefly in the uh, next part of our discussion thank you <laughs>